Hello there, folks in the adventure world. This is Steve Gustafson. I'm doing a virtual workshop for the PRCA, uh, their annual conference and expo. They're sitting down in Stark, Florida, where it's nice and warm. And up here in Rockford, Illinois, it's been below zero. We had minus 14 two mornings ago. So wish I was with you down there in Florida, folks. But glad, but glad to have you here. Now, today's workshop is just this. It's about virtual training, okay? And how can we utilize the internet and virtual training um, for the purposes of our camp, our operations, our program, our university? And, you know, can we even do virtual training? We're such a tactile industry. How do we train if we're not there in person to teach them how and show them knots and how to climb and so forth. So what I'm going to do here, I have a agenda I put, I put together. And let me share that on the screen here. And you'll learn as I'm learning that through in, uh, innovation is brought or spun by demand. We're going to talk a little bit about the virtual training, what it is. Um, we're also going to look at pros and cons. Traditionally, how we've done training in the past and kind of explore some um, opportunities out there that are right now free for the industry. So while virtual training might have some pros and cons, which we'll get into later, I want you to lean in and hear me. There's cost-effective training here. There's cost-effective savings. But first off, myself, Steve Gustafson, I'm here at the PRCA. I run a ropes course business. I've been a builder and in the industry for over 35 years. I own and operate three of our own aero adventure parks and zip lines. And I've been on the PRCA board now since its inception with a couple of years off here or there just to take a break. I won't say I know it all, but I've seen a lot and I'm learning every day and I hope you are too. But that's kind of what I think makes me qualified to look at this is that I've trained thousands of people over the years and I still train my own staff. So I'm looking at how I can handle the stresses of COVID and my staff to um, make sure I'm getting what they need addressed. First off, you know, what is training? What is education? Why do we do it? Um, I was going to obviously look at the dictionary. Anybody can do that. But what training means to me is the gathering or the conveyance of information for the purpose of learning. And learning for what? A life experience, a new how to fix a refrigerator, how to prepare a grilled cheese sandwich. But moreover, learning is the observation of others as well. Because we know, as educators, that 25% of the message is conveyed in our voice and 75% is body language and tone inflections. So in order to get the perfect communication model, you really need to have two people face-to-face, -face, ideally, an interactive and anticipatory conversation and topic. Well, virtual doesn't have that. But we can do the next best thing is that we have one person in the communication. You can see and hear me just fine. And with a live chat or the software now, you could have a camera at your end and chat back with me. Voila, Zoom conference calls. Now, before I get ahead of myself on that, which we'll get to later here in the workshop, I'm going to kind of focus on two ways to train today. I'm going to look at self-taught. And I'm going to look at instructor taught. Now, typically in the ropes challenge course world, zip lines, aero adventure parks, you have people that are being instructed by or trained by the instructor. So you've got a group of 12 people, 10, 25, a, root, a group right now, a room full of 10 folks. And you're going to focus on a topic. Today, we want to learn about how to tie a figure eight knot or how to dress it or 
how to harness fit or how to what are the parts and the operation of a carabiner per se and the instructor goes through and ideally they show you they tell you and then they have you do it yourself it's a three-step process for learning and those of you in the QI course, I'm sure you're being learning all about that. The educational learning models, how to train and teach, retention rates, that sort of thing. And knowing how people learn should be the driver of what we look at in our in-person training, but also the driver of what I want to achieve in my virtual training as well. I need to bond with you through a camera and have the conveyance of the same information. Or if you're an introvert, you might do the self-taught model where you go off, you read books, you watch videos, and that represents about a third of the adults. Again, you've got audio learners, people who can hear and learn. You've got the visual people who need to see the skill so they learn. Or you have the tactile learners, they got to touch and feel and hold the rope and do it all themselves. So an ideal training is going to incorporate all three of those learning models. Otherwise, you might be missing a third, a third, or another third of your audience. So I think the instructor taught is a good way to do it. But now we're looking at virtual instructor. And how is that going to work long term for our industry? Let me take a step back even from here. Before we had virtual, we had electronic or digital and you can go back and look at in-person versus electronic versus virtual training and that history would show us that previous online training was maybe a bulletin board a listserv you could ask questions you maybe watch some videos you could find on the subject you might go to a library whatever that is <laughs> and find some videos in the library or a VHS tape. For those of you who don't know what a VHS S tape is, I just dated myself. Now, I think there's gonna be some pros we look at here and there's gonna be some cons we look at here. I think the biggest thing, a good productive thing about virtual training is it's so flexible with your schedule. You don't really have to necessarily start at nine o'clock. You can start at 9.20 or you can find a date where it works with the trainer. It can be seven o'clock at night. I mean, you can better flexi schedule, flexi work and get the learning done. It doesn't have to be rigid nine to five anymore or Monday through Friday. It could be Sunday at three o'clock. It could be halftime of a football game. It could be before you go to your other full-time work in the morning. I just think there's a lot of flexibility there. It's adaptive. Um, you can change things up. If you're set to meet at one place and you can't make it, well, with phones and laptops and built-in microphones and cameras, you can essentially say, okay, I'm not going to shoot from here today. I'm going to shoot at location B or location Z. So it's really adaptive and you can change subject and you don't have to worry about printing new handouts and new circulation of materials or emails. It's just you do it. It's a lot easier that way. We've also got varied length. Um, I think the day of going to university and sitting there for five classes a day at 50 minutes to an hour each are kind of getting dated. You could have a workshop and learn just one specific skill in two or three minutes. So you look at traditionally a ropes challenge course training is five or seven days, 40, 60 hours of training. And so much of it was repetitive or hiking around. Well, if you chunk all those skills down, could you do skill A in 20 minutes and do the next skill in 10 minutes and the next skill? You can break it up and you could do virtual trainings over more flexible time and schedules and maybe do it in 20 or 30 days, but still get the skills out there that you need to be trained, that need to be trained. So very length, I think, is a pro. Allows for smaller groups. You can do a training for two or three people without the added expense of travel. Now, all of a sudden, doing a virtual training for two people makes more sense than having to get in your car, 
travel somewhere, pay thousands of dollars for an airline ticket and a car rental and hotel just to show up, do a training for $800 or $1,000 or $300 or whatever you're going to pay, and then two people, and then they cancel because it's too low of enrollment. Or the opposite problem, you've got 20 people who want to sign up and only room for 10. Then you have to do another workshop, which is more expense, and logistically that is to be a nightmare. So I think that allows for smaller and larger audiences as well through virtual training. I'm over, I've already alluded to it doesn't require a venue. I mean, yes, you're there and I'm here. These are physical venues, but we don't have to certainly have to go out and have a ropes course available. We don't need to have a trail course available. We don't need to get in our car and go to a brick or morning building with chairs and tables and a convention center and pay for that space. We can utilize space we already have. And doesn't require the travel. All you folks now from the New, New England area are probably loving being in Florida with the big nor'easter going on and the blizzard. But if you had to go to a training and you had inclement weather, that would really affect your travel time. You may not be able to get there and do the training. So, as a pro, there's no training involved. You just get in front of your camera and you have a seat. Um, I think the biggest one here is when you do this training, and right now I'm recording this as well, and we'll put it on the website. Every time you do a training workshop, it becomes a repository of knowledge that you can save for other people to, to join and learn from as well. So while we're live today, this will be saved. You can archive it, put it up, and people can watch it tomorrow, watch it a week from now, a month from now. Go back and revisit it and kind of refresh their memory. Being a repository available 24-7, 365, that is a long-term benefit, a good pro. And last, lower expense. You're just tuning in here to a projector on the wall through a laptop. Ten of you are sharing the resource. And I'm sitting here in my office at the house with a couple of cameras on me, um, a microphone, and my computers. So, didn't have to travel, didn't have to use expense, smaller space, saves money. I think you will join me too in that the cons or the things negative about virtual training for our industry is that we lose that tactile interaction. We miss the chance to pat somebody on the shoulder um, help them hold their figure eight knot and tie it with them. We miss that personal one-on-one -on -one interaction, okay? As a tactile person, I really feel the loss of that interaction with my audience or the trainee. Um, a con also is virtual training. Requires a computer, requires a camera, a microphone, a steady internet connection that um, is stable so you can communicate for a 10 minute class or a three hour class and not have a broken connection. Um, if you don't wanna sit there and hold your phone for three hours in a FaceTime call where your arm gets tired, I mean, where do you have a prop, do you have a little stand for your phone? And do you have earphones so you can hear it in case you have ambient noise behind you? So I'm not saying virtual training's perfect. There's a lot of room to improve but with so many people being locked down from COVID, a lot of folks are going through these learning curves, these, these uh, growing pains. So we're in, we're in the same boat together. So I think there's been a, a universal acceptance of technology and people now are starting to get it that we're doing different kind of training in a virtual way. So I think that's good. Could be distracted. I mean, I'm at the house here I had to make a conscious thought to put my dogs in the room. Otherwise, they could bark at the postman at the door. Someone could come to my office door and knock and interrupt me. Um, someone could ring the doorbell at a UPS gate delivered. My phone could ring, which is good. I forgot I could need to turn my ringer off on my phone so I don't get interrupted or distracted, which is a con of virtual training. My end and at your end. Another thing is, is how do you test behaviors? How do you test skills? If I'm not there to see that figure eight knot and hold it and study it, or look at your harness, how it's fitted on your body and put two fingers in your waist belt and see how snug it is, can I really train over the virtual internet through a camera that skill set? 
I have some ideas. We'll get to that later. And another con is if we do things virtually, if you were at your house tuning in with me at my house, we may not have a ropes course or an aero park or a zip line to go practice these skill sets on. So how do we address that? Now, back in the day, we had electronic or video training. We had online videos. We had CDs and DVDs. Um, I know that Project Adventure, way back in the day, did um, VHS tapes of training and how to build certain low element ropes course and how to do training for that. And my company, not trying to plug it, but we did CDs and DVD training for, uh, for learning as well um, in the early 2000s, which got me in trouble with another association. But my point is the writing was on the wall. We were going that direction. And now COVID and the internet and the ability and technology has kind of grown and brought forward the technology. So these ideas we had back then can be more realized today. And right now, I think the biggest thing is YouTube. Now, everybody likes to say Google or Yahoo information, and that's good. But I think Google and Yahoo and other search engines are a good index of how to find a book or read knowledge, like an old index was for a card catalog for a library. YouTube is the new visual Google, okay? So if you want to know of how to, what to, where, when, why, and how, and you want to see it for your virtual learners, not just your reading or your internal people, you can go to YouTube and find a video. Facebook, for example, if you haven't already, you can search. We've got a private industry Facebook group called Challenge Course Pros. There's 2.7 thousand people or 2700 members here from all over the world you can post a question here and you can see that this person is doing human resource consulting um here i did a post today to remind people about our virtual workshop for the prca conference here and how to find us this person's talking about selling some pulleys they have you know, go to these Facebook groups. There's one here called Challenge Course Pro. There is also another one which is very popular in our industry called Zipline Pros. They tend to focus more on zipline parks. And uh, you can post questions here as well. You know, people talk about pulleys. Um, again, it's under private group. Uh, 1,400 members in this. A lot of overlay with the other with the other zip. Uh, Facebook group, Challenge Course Pros. But every now and again, you'll get a good debate question. This company is going to hire. So this alliance, it's another group of people that um, are a bunch of builders, and they do open video blogs and online learning. Right now, they're looking for board of director members. So Zipline Pros, you know, here's one a guy doing some building at Go Ape. And they might talk about techniques that work and don't work in trees or poles. But just another good resource for you if you don't already know about it. What I'd also like to point out to you is YouTube is a good one. And let me bring that over here on screen. And like I said, it's just like the Google, but it's visual. So if you have a ropes course and you got all these videos, you can kind of tell by five minutes that might be a video that shows about an experience. This one here, Adventure Center for Asheville Zipline, is like 22 minutes. It might be an introduction to the company, might share some information. You've got people doing their backyard zip lines, which may or may not be safe. Who knows what? But I want to point out here, and I'm biased, this is my channel, top of the list. We actually have a whole session of training videos that are online for free. So if you got a summer camp and you wanted to learn about something, I've got one here about how to set utility poles and how do we install some basic hardware on a utility course 
a utility built pole course. Now these are pretty old, like 20, 20 to 25 year old videos, but I'm amazed at how much of the content is still kind of applicable today. But you watch it, see what's applicable, what's not, and then um, use it as appropriately. You got one here on how to safety, how to fit your safety harness, how to belay, what's a belay escape. We do destructive testing, how strong are ropes and zip line equipment. Um, got a part two to that. We've got uh, number five, how to tie a figure eight knot or a bone on a bike, how to coil a climbing rope, how to inspect a climbing rope, you know, health waivers, what are pros and cons, what do you put on a waiver? So there are videos that are available for training online, and some of these are on the PRCA website right now. I also know on the PRCA website, so you can hear in the docs and media, you'll see I've already put in here links to those pieces. So these are all part of your, your membership right now. Okay. And then we're also going to be putting one in here about expert witness testimony and that sort of thing. So YouTube, the PRC website is a resource for you once you log in. I'll log out and just close that real quick. Another area for information for you, and this is how you work the system to find what you need. I know a lot of people think they know how to do it, but sometimes you do things maybe not as efficiently. But I'll go to the search bar or the search icon of the Challenge Course Pros, and I'll just type in podcast. And I can find out who's doing podcasts right now. And I find that this Phil Brown vertical playpen is doing a whole bunch of podcasts. And it's part of the High Adventure Learning Center. They joined them this time. But I think he works with his Workplace Solutions. And if you click on it, that takes you to this, this one podcast of what the facilitators do. I mean, here you go. Let's click here. He has a repository of all the podcasts he's ever done. So while you may not have the visual aspect of this, you do have the audio aspect. And some of this really isn't applicable to us. I think others are. You know, what is experiential learning? You know, what are transferable skills? Not sure what extra time with Teddy is, but I'm sure it has something appropriate to listen to. How do I build my team? What do facilitators do? Assessing needs before the event. I think doing a needs assessment's good. Habits of managers. What are key habits that a manager, if you run a program, you should be doing? So any one of these podcasts, I think, are pretty important. You know, what's the power of play? You just click on anyone. And it just starts to play for you. Hey friends, this is Mark Sprivik, host of the Workplace. And I'm not necessarily being an advocate for any one over the other, but it's a resource for you to have. Just be aware of that resource. Let me go back here to 100 episodes. They got 100 episodes of training uh, on team building. Chris Cavert does some stuff, and he does a lot of games and workshops. So. That's probably had a lot of games about it. So, again, you've got video blogs, you've got virtual trainings, you've got videos you can go look at, you got professional association websites have got resources there. I mean, if you're not finding it, reach out to a builder or a vendor and ask them, hey, do you offer this? A lot of times, if they don't now, there's such a scramble to the industry by all these other vendors that... It's, if it doesn't exist today, it might in a week. It might be in a month. Um, I'm lucky I'm a little bit ahead of that curve because I've been doing it now for years. Uh, not that my foresight was any better than anybody else's, but it kind of is what it is. We talked about the video blog. We talked about podcasts, industry virtual workshops. We talked about the Alliance. We just saw Mark in Workplace Solutions. We heard podcasts, there's virtual training videos that we do in our 
channel for uh, YouTube that are available. And I'm sure there's others available. But you just got to get out there and research it, okay? And all this has the benefit. Now, lean in here now. This all has the benefit for training and disseminating knowledge. What people do with it at their end, it's up to them, which is just kind of like a training. Now, I'm not there to make sure it cements and gets through their skull, but we need to look at how we adjust our industry to accommodate for that. Now, it could be if we had dual cameras, they had a camera at their end and I have a camera at my end, I show them how to tie a figure eight knot, and then they show me back and hold to the camera and I can inspect it. That's doable. It could be that they tie a knot and they can only hear me and then they take a picture and they text it to me or email me a picture. Any way I can validate they tie the knot correctly is all I need to do. I need to document the skill set. Now, I think it gets a little bit more challenging of how do you document tree climbing with safety lanyards with a vertical belay cable. Then you might need to have someone at that end from camp who's a mentor or protege kind of working in tag team with each other. But again, if that person puts on a GoPro or mounts their phone to their chest with one of those selfie sticks and can effectively climb and be connected in, I can see it as a trainer and document the skill. That's what matters. Because really certifying a person or just saying I documented the skills are only effective that day. They still could go out and do it wrong tomorrow. But if you document it that day, sign your paperwork, they attended, you've got your bases covered. Then it's going to be skills and practice and application at their end, which makes them a proficient um, guide or instructor with that information. Oh, another thing that um, also is a benefit. I'm going to go to my channel here on YouTube, which you're at right now watching this whole virtual. Down here, we have the first three seasons of our Zip Away reality show. A couple episodes into four, and I did a special from our season five. I'm still in post-production for season four and five. But at season one, two, and three, if I go to view playlist... Here's 12 episodes of Zip Away TV. Now, it doesn't necessarily talk about training, talk about information, but you do get nuggets of information and wisdom pieces as I just talk in the group or talk in the camera. And if you're an observant person, you can watch my guides and watch my workers and their behaviors and patterns of safety. You can see what they're doing, emulate it, Watch the show, and if you have a question, email me. I'll respond to you. It's another way to learn virtually. But not only can you hear the information, you can go to my show and see my staff implement that same information. So if you want to have a practical learning or a practical use of how that information is being dealt with, there's a show to go watch. Information is information, and... Information's not bad. Information's good. Learning is good. No one knows it all. Also, you've got Zoom calls. That was big. When the pandemic hit, everything was a Zoom call. Zoom, 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 Zoom. And I think at night about now, a lot of folks are Zoomed to death. But I want to look at the future here. You know, we need to address the fact that COVID has been both a blessing and a curse at the same time. It's been a curse because we can't interact. We're an experiential, hands-on, touchy-feely kind of group of people. We like to interact, you know, go to the campfire, you know, have a brewski, have something else, have a meal. Um, go outside, sit by the trees, be up in the trees, on the pole, doing your thing. So, with COVID and you can't travel, or have to wear a mask and everything gets muffled and you can't hear me, it's a curse. I miss the interaction. But it's also a blessing in that it's forcing new opportunities that can accent 
virtually with the intact training as well. So I think we have some unique um, opportunities here for us. If it wasn't for COVID, our industry wouldn't have explored it. I think COVID has been a good stick to poke and prod us to get us going on this new technology that we really all should be doing anyways. You know, embrace it or die is kind of how I look at it. Either you can go for the technology or give it six months, you'll be out of business because somebody else beat you to it. You got to get on this board. COVID pushed this technology upon us because the learning curve is we want to still stay in business or go to school or go to work. And a lot of us who weren't doing virtual work to begin with, the learning curve here was pretty steep. Cameras and software and new laptops and getting reliable internet and setting your life up around for a virtual laptop and sitting there and talking to people for five or six hours. You know, you're not used to sitting down. You know, you go eight nuts. You want to go out? Great. Take a half hour, go out and drag around the block and come back. So it's a curse and a blessing all at the same time. I think more businesses now than ever are providing opportunities as well. So I think I'll see more opportunities come in the future about getting virtual training. I think that technology will get better. I think VR, virtual reality, people wearing goggles. I could almost be virtually on a ropes course at my end. And you could be in virtual goggles at your end. And I could do the skill on the ropes course, and you could see it, and we would essentially be side by side virtually in the atmosphere of a real course. So I don't know if anybody's doing that yet, but boy, wouldn't that be cool. And it would accent even better this whole premise of virtual training. I don't need to be there. You don't need to be here. Save the expense, lower the cost of training, but still you could do it virtually with those goggles on, on a ropes course. And I could watch you visually through an exterior camera, through the virtual reality world of how you were doing and go, hey, wait a minute, check that carabiner. Hey, wait a minute, your lander's twisted. Or wait a minute, look at your rope. It might be really no different than when I'm on a ropes course and I'm doing training and you're in the air and I'm just coaching you from what I see. Just food for thought, food for thought. But I do think there's some specific challenges here now that I don't want to make light of. First, if we're going to do things virtually, that's fine. But how do we test? How do we ensure that they got that skill set and they're going to demonstrate it well? And you can document that they achieved the skill set and did it to a satisfactory level. I used to do testing online through email. I had an, uh, uh, an online script, a little secret link on my website. When I went to a class, I did the seminar, and then when I left, they had three days to go, and I told them this little secret link on my webpage. They clicked on it, and it was a Word document with the questions. They'd open it up, type in their answers, boop, and email it to me. So I was on site, did the visual, did the tactile learning, and did an after written exam to document not only did they see the skill and do the skill, but they could comprehend the skill and articulate that into writing. Kind of close that loop of learning. And I documented, hey, look, they knew about the information. I said it here, they answered it, they knew it at one time. So from a liability perspective, if I ever get sued for not training them right, Hey, here it is. Here's their online exam. You can print it out and show them. They knew the information then and I covered it. So twofold, they get the information and as a trainer, you kind of cover your bases. I think another challenge is going to be, again, is how do you train that skill of climbing a pole or climbing a tree if the trainer, in this case myself, I'm not physically there to support them. Or I can't climb the tree or pole to demonstrate or be on the platform with them 
when they need to answer me a question about, hey, where do my lanyards go? Well, hey, quick, clip something in. You're unclipped. You know, no free burden up here. You know, I don't think virtual training is going to replace that end of it. So I think we need to look at realistic limitations of virtual training and that the virtual training is going to be good for a program that maybe has four or five returning staff and maybe five to ten new staff. The new staff could virtually train and get a lot of this other basic information knocked out. So it would accelerate their learning curve when they got up to camp or they got to the program and the four or five returning staff had 10 newbies. All of a sudden, they've already got their harness fitting skills. They've already got their knot tying skills. They've already learned virtually how to fit a helmet on a, heart, on a head. They've already looked a little bit about a rope's course and what the parts are. They already know about how to coil a rope and what's do's or don't for proper care and storage. You can knock out a lot of this content 70 80 percent virtually and that only accents when you get to camp that in-house staff could do the remaining training of the practical skills assessment and i want to shout out here to hibbs hallmark down in tyler texas because they're a sponsor of the conference this year but when we talk with the agents down there the insurance allows you to train your own staff so those of you sitting in the room down there in Stark, Florida, that have gone are going through the qualified instructor training, this is one of those qualification steps. This is a hidden value that you're going to get from this workshop that affects you while you're certified of going back and training your own people. It teaches you not necessarily the content, but how to disseminate the content, how to look at the learning models, how to document it, how to have attendance sheets, how to have skills assessments, how to have a manual, how to have things documented and consistent through and through for continuity. That's the big thing here. You have to present the information, be con have a continuity of the flow, and document you share that information. And right now I'm saving everything I said here as recording. This is documentation of what this whole virtual workshop, what you learned and what was presented. So if you went in now for the university to get CE, Continuing Education Unit Credits, you could use this workshop as an example. Just saying, think outside the box. Virtual training, while maybe it sounds scary, can kill or achieve two or three or multiple things all at the same time. So embrace technology. Don't shy, don't shy away from it. Embrace it. So... That's kind of what I have for a virtual training workshop. Those are my agenda points. If you've got a question there in the room, um, either Gus, chat with me here. The question we have here from Gus, the president of the PRCA from the conference down there, is folks want to know about, well, if you're on a course doing virtual training and someone does have a lanyard crossed or not hooked in effectively uh, on a course, can a virtual training pick that up? And the answer is yes and no. If you've got a camera on the person climbing or on that deck, and if the camera can see the twisted lanyard, lanyard, then the virtual trainer can see that twisted lanyard. If the camera can't see it, the trainer can't see it. So it's kind of like when you're passing a semi truck on the interstate, if you can't see the mirrors, the mirrors of the trucker can't see you. Same thing. If you can't see a camera, the camera can't see you. So kind of short to Gus's question, you can do it, but you have to have a lot of cameras. But with so many cameras now being Wi-Fi connective and Bluetooth, you could essentially have one laptop in the center of a course. You could put a Bluetooth GoPro at all these stations, have them all connected to your internet, and you could live feed those videos available to your virtual trainer. And they could help watch the people on the decks remotely. Which would be about the same as they was there anyways in the course with all the people in the air. So the question that I just got posted from Gus is, is there a way to do virtual inspections that's in concert with, let's say, the owner of a camp or... Uh, ropes course manager of a camp 
without me, the builder, being on site, could I walk them through what to inspect? And is there a market for that? Well, I think it's a fantastic question. I think it's a very insightful question. So whoever answered it in the room, Gus should buy him a beer. That was a good one. <laughs> um, I don't think anybody's doing that yet, but I don't see why you really couldn't. If you have a competent person down in a course, and if you've got a QI from the PRCA qualified instructor, and that person through education or college training or experience has got that skill set, I don't know why a virtual inspection couldn't be done. I mean, I think you'd have to kind of give them a checklist in advance, have a wrench, have this, have a torque wrench. Essentially, they'd have to have all the tools you would bring to a course. But I think virtually you would talk before the inspection, what you're going to happen, and then go out there and have them show you that they did it. You know, watch them virtually go torque check a random 10% of the fist grips on your course, your wire rope clips. Have them go out with a sledgehammer and hit your utility poles and hit them and sound it. See if there's got rot going on at subgrade level. Have them climb up there and look at that bolt. See if it's tight or if you got any kind of deflection. Take them up there and hey, inspect that woodpecker hole. Hold your phone up or a GoPro camera and show me how deep it is. You could walk them even through how to do minimal repairs, I think. So well, that's a fantastic question. Maybe I'll pick up on that idea. But I think I'm going to cover my, talk to my insurance agent first and see if they approve of it. <laughs> but that's creative. That's a new way that two years ago, we would have never thought inspections could have been done. But now with COVID and the pressure, we're doing it. I think that's good. Good idea. Good question. So we never had another board member in the room mention that really... A virtual inspection should not be the replacement for the annual inspection. And I think there's a lot of validity to that statement because there's things that my 35 year old eye will see or catch in a course that you might miss. Let me give you an example. Um, well, what could you miss? You'd say, I see what the inspector sees, right? But when I'm walking around, I might get a whiff of a smell and odor, like I did at one camp. I had this really strong chemical spray, and they had a storage equipment, uh, an out shed that had the boards were like purposely slatted, so they had good ventilation through there, so the gear would stay and get dried out. But they also had wasp nests on the back, and the maintenance crew would come through and blanket spray the entire back of the gear shed with wasp poison to kill all the wasps and hornets and all that went through the slats and got all the climbing gear and climbing ropes and destroyed it and I had just inspected the gear the day before and passed it all and then when we were on the course the maintenance crew came out and sprayed for hornets and wasps and I would have never gone back to, to see that or had them fail the equipment had I not smelt it so I can't smell virtually, but I was there and I could smell it with one of my other five senses. So that's a good example of how being in person, you can't replace it virtually. So, but I think you're doing a spot inspection, like a quarterly inspection or a semi-annual inspection or documenting a repair that needed to be done from when I was there doing the visit. That's a good use for virtual training or a virtual inspection. But I still think you need to have a professional, a professional there, boots on the ground at least once a year for your insurance needs, and just common sense, I think, as well. All right, that's going to wrap up the training. The folks down there in Florida are going on the next workshop. Anybody here that was not part of the conference that was still here watching, I want to thank you for joining us. I hope you picked up a, trip, a trick or two. Or at least nothing else, I got you thinking about maybe a new way to approach virtual workshops and training and what works and doesn't work or what can work. All right, I think that's it, everybody. Take care. And uh, this is Steve from for the PRCA signing off. Bye-bye.